this is Cassidy Guard with CGTV. I'm here with John Favreau. Hi. Nice. Not the actor. Not the actor. No, <laughs> just the just the person. It's funny because um, people maybe that aren't as involved in politics or don't really know the ins and outs, anytime they hear that name, you know, they obviously reference the actor. Yes. Tell I, me about your experience with that. Well, so I, I was in the White House like the second year I was there, mm -hmm. and I was standing in line to get lunch, and a woman who I worked with like all the time right. turned to me and she was like, Oh, we just saw Iron Man. Like, have you been have you been directing movies in your spare time? I'm like, the thought that I have spare time in this job to go write and direct movies. Like, no, that's not me. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm pretty used to that by now. But I got to meet him uh, once I moved out to LA, and he's a great guy, and we exchanged mail, so that was helpful. I love that. <laughs> I, so I um, was in uh, New York City, Hunter College, 2008, and I remember finding out that um, the potential uh, president of the United States had a really young speechwriter, and I remember it being, I was in a media and politics class, mm -hmm. and we we talked about you a lot, so it's a oh, little wow. surreal, <laughs> and you sort Sorry. of just became this like um, underground celebrity for young people, and I would love to just hear, I mean, it's mind-blowing, like some of the titles are that you wrote some of the most important speeches when you were 26 years old. Yeah. What does that feel like to you? I mean, look, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, Don't be modest. <laughs> this is not the well, time. Well, there was, there was there's a lot of that, right? But I also, I mean, I was on the Kerry campaign right out of college, yeah. and that was because I got an internship in Kerry's office when I was at, I went to the whole College of the Holy Cross. And then um, I ended up meeting Obama his first week in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So he was a brand new senator, and... I was fresh off the Kerry campaign. We lost, and he'd never used a speechwriter before. And um, he didn't think he needed one because he writes, he, and to this day, he still writes a lot of his own mm -hmm. speeches. But uh, Robert Gibbs, who was his communications director at the time, said, look, if there were 48 hours in a day, he wouldn't need a speechwriter, but there's not, so he does. And so you guys should get to know each other, and he should learn to work with you. So and so he gave me a shot, and I got to know him, and that was that. There is a uh, story in Wikipedia, and I want you to tell me in your sure, own words. True. It's something along the lines of you're backstage, you tap him on the oh, shoulder yeah. and suggest you're making a... But at the time, you didn't know it would be the president. So I, didn't, so I did not suggest a line. What happened was I was at the convention. I was in the Kerry campaign. They told me that Obama had a line in his speech that Kerry wanted to use in his speech. And somehow, I guess I was the low guy on the totem pole. So I had to go tell Barack Obama to take the line out of his speech. And this was a line that you had come up with? No, for, this was, okay. this was, Obama had written his speech, he was practicing it, this was his speech, and oh they were like, gosh. but as representative of the Kerry campaign, you have to go ask him to take it out. So I did, and he looked at me like I was, you know, crazy, which was totally understandable. And, uh, and then that's when I met David Axelrod, and he said, you know what, let's just go out and we'll rewrite the line together. And so we did that, and I figured, well, I'll never talk to Barack Obama again. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first experience. He yeah, he, well, he forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> he forgot that was me. So that was, that was how I did that. Okay, I want to fast forward. Say it's like 60 years in the future, and uh -huh. you are getting to tell your grandchildren, whatever it is, like what it was like to be there when he won, yeah. working with him. I mean, I just, I feel like there's something, like, I want to just get a grasp of your magic. There's it's, something there. It's, I mean, it was an incredible time. Um, we were so busy and so nervous that we weren't going to win, that there was never a moment during that campaign, or even in the White House afterwards, where we sat back and relaxed and said, oh, this is historic and wonderful and great. Like, you just don't have time to do that. So I guess you you're really, in it, you're not, you're, you're, you're not. in it, you're in it, and you're just keeping your head down, and you're thinking how to get to the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as now that I've left the White House and I've been out for a couple years, you know, when you look back and reflect on it, especially now that he's nearing the end of his term, so you can start, weird. yeah, you, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia going around with all of the former staffers and, you know, we feel, I think we all feel pretty proud about what we did. What was it like for you to make that decision to, you know, move forward, like, try something new? Yeah, I mean, it's the best, it's probably the best job I'll ever have, what mm -hmm. I did. And he's probably the best boss I'll ever work for. He might not have peaked at 26. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty incredible, but there might be more things in your future so. that are Who just knows? as wonderful. Who knows? Um, but no, it was um, it, it was an amazing experience, and I, it's 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 hard to replicate that. Um, but I, you know, it's I'm very proud of it. Do you have one memory that just stands out when you're just like there was this one time when the, the memory that always stands out for me? Uh, we talked about you know being excited and kind of thinking about the history of it all. Mm -hmm. The night of the election. Um, we ended the speech, the victory speech, with a story about a woman named Ann Nixon Cooper mm -hmm. who had waited in line for three hours that day to vote, and she was 103 years old. I remember this. 
and I remember we, you know, we didn't know we were going to use that version of the speech because we didn't know if we were going to win. And then when it looked like we were going to win, Obama called. We made edits to the speech. It was done. And then my friend said, you know, we should probably reach out to Ann Nixon Cooper and let her know she's about to get a bit of a shout out. And like, so I'm getting goosebumps right now. I was good. No. So I call. I called her, and oh. I remember talking to her on the phone, and she was like, you know, what? what channel is this going to be on? You know, and I was like, oh, it'll be on all the channels, you know? And, and then right as I was on the phone with her, they called Ohio, and that was it. And then had the whole, so the whole campaign is going crazy and screaming, and I'm on the phone with this uh, really lovely woman. And, you know, that, that was one small moment where I got to think, this is, this is a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. Do you think that you yourself would ever want to run or go into politics? You know, I used to think about that when I was a kid. And then having been in politics for as long as I have, <laughs> I, I left hoping that more people would run, mm-hmm. but I also know that for me, it's just, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. You put yourself out there and, you know, the, the work that you have to do and the sleepless nights and, uh, you know, I sort of did that not as a candidate, but as a staffer for 10 years and it, uh, it seems hard to do that again, <laughs> except even more so. Like, because if we, th- we thought we were all tired, President Obama was about, you know, 10 times more tired than the rest of us were. So it's a, it's a tough thing. I think I'm pretty good just commentating for now. So taking it to 2016, yes. what are your thoughts? I mean, <laughs> I don't actually know if you, I, I know that uh, his office has publicly endorsed Hillary Clinton. I don't know where you're on. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm supporting Hillary. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah as, I, as, I hope, as I hope most people are. Yeah. Um, but look, I think every, I don't think Donald Trump's going to win. I think um, he was very skilled during the primary at figuring out how to break out in a very crowded field. Mm-hmm. And, but I think right now, you know, there's just, he doesn't have the voters and he doesn't have the numbers um, to get over the top. And I think people have realized he's not a serious candidate. He's not fit for the office. And we're going to have four months of, will he catch up? Won't he, you know, is this a tight race? And I just, I don't think it will be in the end, but I think, you know, we shouldn't take anything for granted and everyone has to turn out to vote and young people have to, especially young people, we have to register. Mm -hmm. We have to go vote because enough people stay home than Donald Trump's president. What are your thoughts on social media and the way that it's changed the election? Because obviously in 2008, Twitter wasn't right. as big of a deal. And, and I just want to hear from you because I'm, I'm loving the Hillary tweets to, <laughs> to Trump. They're making me laugh. It's just, good, yeah. They're wonderful. So no, I mean, I think it speeds things up a lot. I think mm-hmm. if we had, uh, you know, we talked about tw- the 24-hour news cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's every second. I mean, there's, you know, a story pops up, mm-hmm. everyone freaks out over it, and then 10 minutes later it's gone, right? And so it's a constant stream of news that you have to keep up on. But I think, you know, I mean, you mentioned the Hillary tweets. I think any time you can have, you know, in every election you should take the issues very, very seriously. Mm-hmm. But you should try as best you can not to always take yourself seriously and to have some fun with it. And I think, and Twitter and social media are a good place for that. Mm -hmm. And it's not a good place for like, oh, your staff comes up with a joke for you and they like do it just right. Like they make a meme, they they make a meme. Like there's ways you can go a little too far. Right. But a little humor, um, once in a while goes a long way. And I think it's one, it's a, it's a good strategy to sort of break through the noise. Okay, I just want to hear from you before we let you go. Sure. What are you working on right now? I mean, what's kind of fueling so your right, passion? Right now, I am. Um, I have a podcast mm-hmm. uh, as part of The Ringer, which is Bill Simmons' new venture. And I'm a columnist for The Ringer as well. So uh, that keeps me busy in politics. And then uh, I have a small speechwriting firm uh, with my best friend called Fenway Strategies. And we, uh, we're both from Boston. <laughs> and, uh, and we do speechwriting for... Boston boys stick together. We stick together. <laughs> we stick together. And uh, yeah, and so we do some speech writing and, and other stuff. For, I, uh, I never know because sometimes people are really open. They have speech writers. Do you guys publicly say who you write for? Or is it kind of on the DL? Which it's is kind fun. of on the DL, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's fun. But I look, I, I've, I've really enjoyed, as the elections ramped up, sort of getting back into politics a little bit from my perch in Los Angeles. <laughs> definitely well, definitely don't want to go back to Washington. Right. No, not at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I, want, I left the White House and I was happy not to pay attention for a little while. Yeah. And now that it's a couple years out, I, can't, I just can't ignore it. I can't avoid it. I, I've, I've been bitten by the political bug and, you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to go back. And as a conclusion, what are the three elements that every great public speaker or a speech must have to really make people pay attention and listen? I mean, it has to have a story. Um, not like a story about someone, but every speech should be a logical argument with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And a speech is not a collection of sound bites and applause lines. And I think a lot of people 
think about that today. Um, so that's number one. I think it needs to be short. <laughs> I think I think attention spans are short these days and getting shorter. We talked about social media. Um, you know, don't don't make your speech longer than 15, 20 minutes. There's nothing. It, believe me. Uh, so I think brevity is good. And then I think you do need to have some humor. I, um, I think that's important too. I lighten it up a little bit so you're not boring people with a bunch of policy details. Thank you so much for your time. I Thanks really enjoyed chatting. It's with been you. fun. Yeah. So this is Cass Seeger with CGTV, and thank you so much for John Favreau for joining us today. Thank you.